With plural disorders, I find that it's nice to break things down according to the three phases of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. Um, so in this talk, um, we're going to first start with pneumothoraces, then move on to plural effusions, and then finish with plural thickening and masses. Um, we're just going to spend a little bit of time um, also talking about pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium, just because those two entities probably fit best within this talk than the other uh, first year uh, chest radiology talks we've prepared for you. Um, one other note, um, because the diagnoses of pneumothoraces and pleural effusions are relatively trivial on chest CT, uh, we'll be primarily focusing on chest x-ray appearances for the first two portions of this talk. So let's start with pneumothoraces and other abnormal air accumulations in the chest. Uh, when we're talking about abnormal air accumulations in the chest, um, we're going to be discussing uh, abnormal air accumulation in the pleural space, mediastinum, or pericardial space, um, uh, pneumothoraces, pneumomediastinum, and pneumopericardium. Um, when these events occur, um, the air has to be introduced into these spaces from somewhere. And the most likely sources are either um, the lung, uh, in the setting of some sort of perforation or disruption of the lung parenchyma um, or barotrauma. Uh, could be from the esophageal lumen in the setting of an esophageal perforation. Um, the rare cases uh, where the gas is coming from just within the mediastinum perhaps or within the chest uh, due to a gas forming infection and situations where the gas may be coming from without uh, from the environment via a interruption of the chest wall. But we want to focus on pneumothoraces right now. Um, when we look at the causes of pneumothoraces, they kind of break down into um, half um, caused by some sort of traumatic event, uh, whether it's an accidental trauma or iatrogenic trauma, a quarter um, due to some sort of idiopathic spontaneous event, um, I tend to think of, say, spontaneous rupture of subpleural blebs in uh, tall, younger uh, folks. And another quarter um, caused by some sort of underlying lung abnormality. If we create a kind of a crude um, uh, um, graph of uh, incidence of pneumothoraces uh, versus age, there is a relatively bimodal distribution um, of younger folks and then older folks. Um, and for younger folks, uh, the causes are more often some sort of traumatic event or a spontaneous kind of, um, um, say, a blood rupture or something like that. Whereas in older folks, um, the causes are more often due to some sort of underlying lung um, abnormality that predisposes a patient to barotrauma. trauma. And so things like COPD are a common uh, cause. But there are other causes, as you've seen us list here, um, cystic lung diseases and, and, and such. Um, when we talk about the, uh, the diagnosis of a pneumothorax, um, imaging usually plays a big part. Uh, and the four imaging studies that are most often involved are the, you know, the conventional portable chest x-ray, um, the occasional decubitus chest x-ray we do at the bedside, upright chest x-rays done in radiology and chest CTs. When people are ordering an imaging study to study or to evaluate for a pneumothorax, um, they're usually trying to answer three questions. Uh, is there a pneumothorax there? Um, how big is it? And maybe they're trying to get a better understanding of uh, whether we're dealing with a complex pneumothorax and how big it is and what's the, the distribution in, in anatomic space. Um, and when we um, talk about these different imaging modalities, it's also important to be cognizant of uh, which ones tend to be more useful uh, for your critically ill patients. And when we look at these uh, four imaging modalities here, um, you know, what's clear is that you know, of all these modalities, CT is probably the most effective at characterizing pneumothoraces because you get to you know, see the patient's anatomy um, in, in three dimensions. Um, and it's uh, pretty good at studying um, critically ill patients as long as they're safe enough to travel to the CT scanner. On the other side, um, you'll notice that the performance of portable chest x-rays um, is you know, relatively just, you know, okay or fair uh, 
um, compared to CT. Um, they're okay at detecting pneumothoraces, but there's always going to be the small one or the one that's more kind of anterior as opposed to apical that um, we may not always be able to catch. Um, because we're looking at a two-dimensional shadowgram, um, it's not always easy to truly understand how big the pneumothorax really is. Um, we don't really see the perhaps the on fos components of the pneumothorax. And because of this, uh, complex loculated pneumothoraces are also hard to characterize in a portable chest x-ray. And for, you know, working up, um, you, know, pay, you know, critically ill patients for pneumothoraces, um, chest x-rays, portable chest x-rays are of limited but okay value. Now, decubitus and upright chest x-rays um, have one thing substantially better than uh, your conventional portable chest x-ray, and it's their ability to detect pneumothoraces. Um, so both those imaging modalities are a lot, lot more sensitive uh, for detecting a pneumothorax, but they do suffer from the fact that they're not quite as uh, useful, perhaps, in the critically ill uh, patient setting. Uh, because you may not always be able to put your patient into a decubitus position, or they may not be safe to travel to a, a radiology room to get a chest x-ray done. Um, next slide is just something um, I think that's probably common sense. Um, pneumothoraces tend to be easier to see when they're large. And the reason is, is um, just to remind ourselves that, you know, as a pneumothorax gets larger, the atelectasis of the associated lung gets more and more pronounced. And as a result, the 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 density difference between the lung and the, the pleural air becomes much, much more conspicuous. And that's what makes these large pneumothoraces more visible. But it's probably more important to discuss, you know, what is it that we're looking for on a chest x-ray that tells us that this person has a pneumothorax? Um, the most traditional um, imaging feature people talk about um, is just a curvilinear interface uh, near the lung apex. Uh, why is that? Um, well, you know, when a pneumothorax occurs, especially when it's still small, it's going to travel to the most non-dependent portion of the chest. And in a patient who's upright, the most non-dependent portion of the chest are the apices. And so it's not surprising that if a pneumothorax occurs, we see a curvilinear interface at the lung apex. And it's probably equally not too surprising to kind of, you know, understand that the manifestation of a pneumothorax on a decubitus x-ray is going to be some sort of linear or curvilinear interface that's parallel to the expected lateral margin of the lung, um, but within the ribcage. However, um, we start moving on to uh, portable images uh, where the patient is um, supine or at least at most semi-upright. Um, the imaging presentation of a small pneumothorax may not necessarily be what we first expect. And the reason is the non-dependent portion of the chest is no longer the apex in these settings, but the anteromedial lower chest. And so if there's going to be a pneumothorax, you're going to see it there before you see it at the lung apex. So if that's the case, uh, what is that we're looking for if we're trying to catch a smaller pneumothorax on a portable chest x-ray? Well, it requires us to perhaps uh, change the uh, initial field of focus from the apex to the medial lower lungs. And we may see a lucency at the, near the lung base, or what's called a deep sulcus sign. Um, the cause of a deep sulcus sign basically has to do with the anatomical situation that we might remember from first year medical school, how the pleural space extends two rib spaces more inferiorly than the lungs do. And that extra two rib spaces of pleural um, space is usually just a potential space that's not visible to us on a chest x-ray. However, if you have a situation where you're accumulating air near the lung bases, um, that potential space can become filled with gas all of a sudden and become perceivable on a chest x-ray as um, a lucency that you're not used to seeing there. Um, or that the what you think might be the lung base seems to be extending a lot more inferiorly than you, you're usually used to. That's what a deep sulcus sign basically is. Um, here's some examples of patients with uh, small pneumothoraces, um, but these are portable chest x-rays in a relative supine position. And you can see how in this case, we have a pneumothorax um, kind of sitting right below the inferior surface of the right middle lobe, causing this kind of uh, lucent uh, basilar um, 
accumulation of gas. Um, you might see how this um, patient has a more lucent um, left lung base because there is air accumulating there with the pneumothorax. Um, another uh, place where um, air may accumulate um, in a supine patient uh, in the setting of a pneumothorax may be along the um, margin of the cardiac silhouette, like in this patient here. Um, and this patient has um, a deep sulcus sign. Now, um, whenever we talk about uh, pneumothoraces, it's always uh, kind of um, important to um, discuss tension pneumothoraces. These are pneumothoraces that are under, uh, are under positive pressure. Um, and we always are um, concerned about looking for these uh, because they can have um, substantial hemodynamic uh, uh, consequences um, if they're allowed to get large enough to compress the venous return to the heart. Uh, the imaging features that were on the lookout um, to suggest that may, there may be a tension pneumothorax uh, are basically the secondary effects of having a high pressure, um, you know, air accumulation in the pleural space. Um, those are um, displacement of the mediastinal anatomy away from the pneumothorax. Um, sometimes it may be self-evident. Other times you may just notice that, hey, the, the trachea or an ET tube doesn't seem like it's midline or maybe the NG tube is a midline. And uh, another secondary feature um, is uh, inferior depression of the hemidiaphragm on the side of the pneumothorax. Tension pneumothoraxes um, occur uh, when you have a disruption of the visceral pleura in such a way that you've created kind of a flap of tissue that can act as a one-way check valve. And what happens is um, with every you know, respiratory cycle, you push air from the lung into the pleural space, but don't permit it to return. So it acts as a, basically a one-way pump of air into the pleural space. So not only do you end up having a large pneumothorax, you have a large pneumothorax that's under positive pressure. So that, and that, and that positive pressure can start pushing and displacing structures in the mediastinum. And flabby structures like central veins have the potential of being um, pinched off, to compressed um, in such a way that could seriously impede venous return to the heart and therefore cardiac output. And that's why these tension pneumothoraces are, are so dangerous. Now, when it comes to diagnosing pneumothoraces on chest x-rays, it's important to be on the lookout for common mimics. So we don't want to um, call a pneumothorax where there wasn't one. Uh, one common mimic are skin folds. Uh, when a technologist is doing a portable chest x-ray, they need to wedge this detector cassette or the film cassette underneath the patient while they're lying on the gurney. And when you're doing this, it's, it's you know, not unusual to create some skin folds as that cassette gets pushed in. And those skin folds can sometimes look like pneumothoraces. Um, how do we know that we're dealing with a skin fold as opposed to pneumothorax? Well, um, we may be fortunate to see that the interface that we think is a pneumothorax actually travels past the ribcage. That's something a pneumothorax wouldn't do. And another more subtle feature is um, if you look closely at the interface um, caused by a skin fold, you'll often see that um, immediately medial to that interface, um, there's kind of a gradient opacity as opposed to just kind of lucent lung all the way to the interface. Subpleural fat at the lung apices can also sometimes mimic pneumothoraces because what you see is lung doesn't quite make it all the way to the, um, the inner surface of the rib cage at the lung apices. Um, your hints in this kind of situation may be bilaterality or just noticing that it was present on successive prior chest x-rays. Um, inferior rib margins can sometimes also mimic a pneumothorax. Um, that happens because the inferior surface of a rib is not always flat. You might actually have kind of two lips um, anterior and posteriorly, and you may perceive one of those lips to be the quote unquote inferior rib margin and mistake the other one for being a pneumothorax paralleling that rib. And finally, the medial border of the scapula can sometimes appear like a pneumothorax too. Um, and you know, usually if you're careful enough to kind of trace out the outline of the scapula on both sides, you'll realize that's not a pneumothorax. Here's just an imaging appearance of um, skin folds uh, or an example of skin folds. 
And you can see the skin fold on the right, um, that interface travels actually a little past the, um, the rib cage um, in this patient. And if you look at um, the lateral upper right lung and travel from medial to lateral approaching that interface, you can see how there's a faint uh, gradient as that kind of, um, as that perceived lung or whatever looks kind of whiter and whiter and whiter until you hit the interface and then bam, it drops off into lucency. Um, that's more typical of um, skin folds rather than uh, true pneumothoraces. Now, um, occasionally we'll enter, we'll encounter a situation where not only is there pneumothorax, but there's a coexisting pleural um, fluid accumulation too. Uh, we refer to these as hydropneumothoraces. Um, and the air fluid interface um, may be beautifully demonstrated um, if the patient's image in such a way that the air fluid level is in profile to your image, uh, namely um, a upright PA film or perhaps a decubitus film. Um, the causes of a hydropneumothorax are most usually trauma or post-surgery, but there are less common uh, causes. Um, when we think about these, we're often perhaps thinking of um, a chronic infection in the bronchopleural fistula or a tumor necrosis in a bronchopleural fistula. The bronchopleural fistula being responsible for the error and whatever the other issue, the infection and necrosis perhaps being the, the cause of the ipsilateral pleural fluid. Uh, before we move on uh, to the next slide, just wanted to just to describe how um, we may choose to describe hydropneumothoraces in a report. Um, we may want to actually describe hydropneumothoraces not in terms of how big the whole thing is, but how big the air phase is and how big the fluid phase is. Because you can get hydropneumothoraces that are 95% fluid and 5% gas or the other way around. All right, um, let's now move on to pneumomediastinum. Um, common causes of pneumomediastinum are trauma, um, either you know, from you know, direct um, injury or perhaps barotrauma. Uh, barotrauma can happen in, in multiple types of settings. Um, underlying lung disorders can occasionally be a cause of pneumomediastinum. Um, we kind of alluded to this um, when we were talking about causes of pneumothorax thoraces um, earlier in this talk. Um, less common causes of the pneumomediastinum um, include esophageal perforations and the rare um, gas forming um, infection. Um, when you encounter a pneumomediastinum, uh, the classic imaging feature are these kind of vertically oriented kind of streaky lucencies throughout the mediastinum. Um, but I have to admit, they're often really hard to see, especially prospectively. And oftentimes, uh, what I will see is um, basically a little bit of a later finding within the neck and the chest wall. Um, pneumomediastinums, as they progress, uh, will eventually dissect into the neck. And uh, gas within the soft tissues of the neck sometimes are a little bit more conspicuous than gas within the mediastinum. Um, so here's one of those kind of examples. This is a patient with pneumomediastinum. And you can probably see these streaky lucencies um, in the lower neck, and particularly kind of at the, the left base of the, the lower neck there. Um, and the pneumomediastinum is there if you, we look carefully enough, but it's certainly the, um, the gas in the neck that kind of catches your attention at first. Now, obviously, uh, when the pneumomediastinums get much larger, um, they're, they're obviously much, much more conspicuous. Um, uh, even without looking at the, the lower neck. Um, pneumomediastinums can sometimes have other um, kind of imaging presentations in addition to just dissection into the neck. Um, sometimes uh, the pneumomediastinum can dissect along um, and under the parietal pleura. Uh, when that happens, you might have a look that kind of looks like a, like a, look like a medial pneumothorax. Um, the same thing can sometimes happen um, in the space between the pericardium and the diaphragm. It can give you a kind of a, a linear lucency that's just inferior to the cardiac sublet. Pneumopericardiums are much, much more uncommon than pneumothoraces and uh, pneumomediastinum. Uh, these are situations where um, air has entered the pericardial space. Um, usually it's a sign of substantial injury um, because uh, not only did you have to have an injury that was severe enough to result in 
you know, air from the lung or perhaps esophagus uh, leaving and going where it doesn't belong, but you have to have also violated the pericardium so that the air can get into that pericardial space. Uh, so trauma and perhaps, uh, you know, iatrogenic causes uh, tend to be the more uh, uh, common, uh, you know, sources of uh, pneumopericardium when we ever do encounter these. Um, barotrauma is a, is a much, much more uh, uncommon uh, cause of a pneumopericardium. And here's a nice example. All right, let's move on to fluid, uh, specifically pleural effusions, um, empyemas, and hemothoraces. Um, as we may remember from, uh, from medical school, um, there's always a, a trace amount of fluid within the pleural space that allows the, allows the visceral and parietal pleural surfaces to slide and the lung to move um, you know, during our inspiratory and expiratory uh, breathing cycles. Um, however, when the fluid within the pleural space is substantially greater than its physiologic amount, um, that's uh, what we refer to as a pleural effusion. Uh, pleural effusions can be transudative um, or exudative in nature. Transudative ones uh, are usually um, uh, caused by some sort of imbalance of starling forces um, in the setting of cardiogenic pulmonary edema or issues with uh, oncotic pressure where perhaps there's not enough uh, protein within the uh, plasma to hold on to that fluid. Uh, transudative pleural effusions um, are usually free-flowing, only unless there's pre-existing adhesions within the pleural space. Exudative pleural effusions are uh, usually different in cause. Um, causes tend to be either malignant or inflammatory. Uh, inflammatory infectious or inflammatory uh, non-infectious. Um, exudative pleural effusions, unlike transudative pleural effusions, are more often associated with some degree of pleural thickening, um, perhaps um, adhesions and scarring that lead to loculation of that pleural fluid. The imaging presentations of uh, pleural effusion, especially on chest x-ray, uh, tend to be pretty variable and may also vary, not just uh, from day to day, but on the position of the patient um, or it's uh, how it's distributed within the chest. Um, so it's important to kind of review all the potential imaging manifestations of a pleural effusion on chest x-ray. The classic sign that we've all been taught is the meniscus sign. Uh, traditionally, in an upright chest x-ray, um, fluid will accumulate within the, um, the inferior portion of the pleural space and result in this kind of a blunted uh, costophrenic angle or a meniscus to form. Um, because the posterior costophrenic angle is more inferior than the lateral costophrenic angle, um, we tend to pick up much smaller effusions on lateral than PA chest x-rays in the upright position. Um, because on the lateral film, you get a nice shot of the most inferior costophrenic angle, the posterior costophrenic angle. So just a few examples of pretty traditional, conventional looking uh, pleural effusions that result in blunting of that costophrenic angle, like this one on the left side. There are other ways uh, pleural effusion can manifest besides a blunting of a costophrenic angle. Uh, one of those is an apparent elevation of the hemidiaphragm. Um, sometimes um, pleural effusions may have a predilection to accumulating subpulmonically. And so uh, what you're going to see is aerated lung and then uh, what looks like diaphragm elevated, but actually may be a layer of fluid between the true diaphragm and the inferior margin of the lung. Uh, this is uh, what we refer to here as a, a thickened diaphragm kind of sign. Um, a subtle feature that you may sometimes see that will give you a clue that this is what you're dealing with is uh, what's called basically a shift, if you will, of the apex of the diaphragm. Um, in some folks, um, in a normal state, the dome of the diaphragm is slightly um, medial to that mid-axillary line. And with accumulation of a subpulmonic effusion, um, what you may perceive to be the apex may shift slightly lateral to the mid-axillary 
um, midclavicular, sorry, midclavicular one. Um, here's an example of a subpulmonic pleural effusion um, that looks like just elevated right hemidiaphragm, but all that um, opacity that you see um, inferior to the, uh, the right lung is actually um, an amount of pleural fluid, uh, probably caused by um, hemothorax in the setting of a malpositioned cardiac conduction lead here. Um, another way that um, pleural fusions may manifest um, instead of uh, just a blunted costophrenic angle is what's referred to as a lateral pleural band. Um, this tends to happen uh, more often on portable chest x-rays. Um, so as fluid in the pleural space accumulates, um, it may accumulate along the lateral margin of the lung. Uh, when that happens, you get this layer of fluid between the rib cage and the lateral margin of the lung. Um, kind of like on the left side in this patient. Um, in patients with uh, pleural effusions um, um, in the kind of portable chest x-ray setting, you may not always see blunting of the costophrenic angle. This may be the next feature that you see. Um, lateral pleural bands, um, especially new ones, um, tend to be uh, relatively specific for pleural effusion. Um, the operative word being new, uh, because uh, another cause of a pleural band uh, lateral pleural band is just pleural fat. Um, the difference between pleural fat and pleural effusions uh, manifesting as lateral pleural bands are that pleural fat is usually a bilateral process um, and a chronic process. Pleural effusions on portable chest x-rays can also manifest as what we refer to as a gradient opacity, um, as the fluid kind of pools um, posterior to the lungs and perhaps slightly more inferior than superior because the patient may not be totally supine, but in a kind of a semi-supine um, position. And if you were to image pleural fluid in a patient like this on a portable chest x-ray, you're going to perceive basically just a kind of a, a opacity that's... Um, in the lower chest that kind of just dissipates like a gradient does because um, the fluid is much more thicker in the AP kind of um, dimension uh, inferiorly and then it kind of becomes less and less thick or deep as you move superiorly because the patient's slightly um, you know, upright. Um, here's another example of one of these gradient opacities except on the left side there's a layering pleural fusion that's posterior to the the lower lung, the left lung on this image. Um, in a patient who's totally supine, say like a trauma bed patient, um, you may perceive not a gradient, but just a, a homogeneous uniform attenuation increase because the depth of the fluid is uniform from inferior to superior. And it may look like this on a chest x-ray. And so this is another example of a uh, pleural effusion. This one, there's not really a perceivable blunting of costophrenic angle. Um, there's not a lateral pleural band to speak of, but you can see that it's just this uniform homogeneous opacity that makes the right lung look very different than the left lung. Um, obviously, uh, lateral pleural bands can also occur on uh, decubitus um, chest x-rays. Uh, pleural effusions can sometimes accumulate within the fissures. Um, when they do, um, they may come and go. So you may see the amount of uh, fluid in the fissure vary from portable to portable. And the imaging appearances um, of a fissural pleural fluid accumulation uh, vary depending on if it's uh, being viewed on uh, viewed in profile or on FOSS. Um, if you have, say, a lateral chest x-ray, it's um, often easy to see the margins of the fissure um, very sharply and uh, identify a fissural pleural fluid accumulation as basically this kind of mass, this lenticular mass of relatively nice circumscribed um, interfaces. Um, when we look at this kind of situation on FOSS, say on a frontal x-ray, uh, what you may perceive is just a, a focal opacity with very indistinct margins. Um, the presence of fluid within the, uh, along the fissure does not necessarily imply that it's loculated. It just can, it just happens sometimes. Um, but on the subject of loculated pleural effusions, um, sometimes um, pleural fluid is not free to move um, throughout the pleural space, and it's kind of um, kind of sequestered or trapped in some areas. Um, this tends to happen in the setting of exudative um, pleural effusions, um, but not really in transitive pleural effusions, unless the transitive pleural effusion is occurring in the setting of 
prior event that might have led to some scarring in the pleura. Um, and, you know, some nice examples of loculated uh, pleural fluid accumulations. Um, here's an example of an empyema. Here's another empyema. And here's another one. And we recognize these are loculated because the pleural fluid is not freely flowing in its normal expected kind of distribution that we, you know, we see a lot. Uh, pleural effusions um, can sometimes be hemorrhagic. Um, hemorrhagic pleural effusions are often uh, identified because the fluid is not simple fluid in attenuation. Uh, you may discover this by measuring with an ROI or just by somebody's visual inspection, realizing that the pleural effusion and the muscle seem to be similar um, in attenuation, if not the pleural fluid being even greater. Um, and here's an example like these. Um, hemothoraces are not always homogeneous in parents. Sometimes you can get a mixture of blood and fluid resulting in a kind of a heterogeneous appearance. So just be on the lookout for that. So it's not unusual, for example, to have, a, say, a hemothorax where um, some areas are measuring simple fluid and some areas are not. So don't always be satisfied with only one ROI. Uh, chylus pleural effusions, um, probably um, yeah, more uncommon than uh, hemorrhagic uh, pleural effusions, uh, usually um, in the setting of uh, lymphatic uh, fluid accumulating within the chest. And there's just lots of different reasons why that could happen. Um, the traditional chylus pleural effusions are below um, zero Hellenfeld units, um, but they're not all that way. And so there will be plenty of times um, during your career uh, you'll encounter a chylus pleural effusion that actually measures simple fluid rather than less than zero. And when they present as uh, ones that are of similar attenuation to simple fluid, they're going to be indistinguishable from your normal, um, if you will, uh, pleural effusions. Um, finally, uh, we want to wrap up this discussion of pleural disorders um, uh, with a little bit of um, uh, conversation about pleural thickening and masses. Um, and we'll start with pleural thickening first. Uh, the causes of pleural thickening, uh, long story short, um, are um, entities like pleural inflammation, uh, pleural scarring, uh, or pleural malignancy. That uh, could be a primary or a, a metastatic tumor. Um, causes of pleural inflammation and pleural fibrosis are generally any cause of an exudative pleural effusion. And if you remember, uh, those causes um, are either uh, infectious inflammatory or non-infectious inflammatory. So anything that causes an exudative pleural effusion can potentially cause pleural thickening. Um, we'll recognize pleural um, thickening as um, a soft tissue rind that's maybe displacing the um, lateral margin of the lung from the rib cage. Um, they're going to be um, sometimes difficult to distinguish from just a pleural effusion on a chest x-ray. And it's one of those diagnoses that we'll be more comfortable making on chest CT rather than chest x-ray. Um, pleural thickening um, often uh, will enhance, uh, but the amount or the pattern enhancement uh, isn't always going to be very helpful in helping us distinguish uh, malignant from benign causes of pleural thickening. The imaging features of uh, pleural thickening that are worrisome uh, include a thickening that's nodular or circumferential um, in distribution. Um, folks have always said that uh, pleural thickening along the mediastinal surface is always uh, concerning. Uh, traditionally, it was said that uh, mediastinal pleural thickening occurs in the setting of only two issues, uh, malignancy and tuberculosis. Um, I don't think I've encountered many exceptions to that rule so far, at least in my own practice. Uh, pleural thickening, um, that's not only circumferential and mediastinal, but also involves the fissures, is also highly suspicious, um, like in this example. And obviously, um, uh, pleural thickening that's focal, especially if it invades the chest wall with the mediastinum, is also um, highly suspicious. Things that are um, suggested for a benign um, kind of situation um, are when the pleural thickening forms a uniform thickness plaque. Um, some of these can be non-calcified, um, or some of these are calcified. And so calcified uh, pleural thickening is also 
um, usually um, something that's suggestive for um, um, a benign cause. Um, occasionally, uh, we'll see imaging um, of patients who've had a pleurodesis. Um, and when pleurodesis is performed, uh, you may also see pleural thickening, but the pleural thickening tends to be uh, more higher, more flocculent um, in its attenuation. Um, and so you'll see examples like in this patient here. And these, these, you know, these areas of um, pleural thickening that are kind of high in attenuation uh, can, are usually um, clumps, um, but occasionally can be diffuse. Uh, it's been reported that uh, pleurodesis um, or associated um, pleural thickening can be FDG avid on PET imaging. And you can imagine that these, especially if they're not terribly hyperattenuating, um, could be conceivably uh, confused with uh, pleural malignancy sometimes. Um, we wanted to just kind of um, have a few words about pleural masses um, in addition to pleural thickening. Um, in terms of pleural masses, um, I'm usually thinking of um, uh, lipomas and solitary fibrous tumors on the benign side of the ledger and um, the occasional um, metastasis on the other side. Um, when we're um, trying to interpret um, chest x-rays uh, and we're counting a candidate uh, pleural mass, well, we always have to ask ourselves, um, is this really a pleural mass or could it be a mass in the peripheral lung? Um, and one of the um, signs that can sometimes help us distinguish a pleural mass from a peripheral lung mass is what's called the extra pleural sign. And that involves um, what does the, um, the margins of that mass look like along its, its edges? Um, are the margins obtuse, um, like in the first drawing on the left here, or acute, like the second drawing? Um, pleural masses tend to have obtuse margins, or kind of a tail, uh, whereas uh, peripheral lung masses tend to not. Uh, this has been discussed, described as the cat under rug sign as well. So I guess uh, the suggestion is, is if you had a cat under a rug, I guess the margins of the carpet would form would be more um, obtuse angles as opposed to acute angles. Um, one note though is this, this sign tends to work better um, with smaller masses uh, when masses start getting large. Um, uh, maybe it, this, this, uh, this sign tends to fall apart a little bit. As we said, um, when we think about you know, pleural masses, uh, one of the uh, three top answers is a pleural lipoma. Um, these tend to be small, but can occasionally be quite large. Um, and you know, the imaging feature is going to be you know, a mass that's of attenuation uh, consistent with macroscopic fat. And you know, we obviously are you know, hoping that this macroscopic fat is, is clean in its appearance. Um, you start seeing too much um, soft tissue component within this fatty mass, uh, you may need to worry about something that's a little bit more sinister, like a liposarcoma. Um, solitary fibrous tumors um, are the second um, kind of thing on my list that I could think about in terms of uh, large pleural masses. Um, these can grow slowly over years and end up being quite large when they're first diagnosed. Um, classically, some have been described to be attached um, by a thin fibrovascular stalk um, to the lung. And because of that, um, can shift in location very, very dramatically uh, from one chest x-ray to another. Um, and as we mentioned, um, uh, because the um, extra pleural sign tends to um, fall apart a little bit um, with larger masses, the larger ones uh, tend to be hard to distinguish from primary lung masses. Um, though looking for adaluxus helps a little bit. Um, what the meaning there is, is um, we tend to see um, more adaluxus of lung adjacent to pleural masses than a true lung mass. Um, finally, um, the third thing we wanted to kind of mention as a potential cause of a pleural mass, in this case, a malignant cause, is a pleural metastasis. But it turns out um, pleural metastasis, you know, they, they obviously happen, um, are more likely to present as uh, malignant pleural thickening or pleural effusion rather than a discrete mass. Um, the one kind of, uh, you know, example being, you know, a thymoma. Um, some imaging examples of uh, pleural metastases, but I think this is the kind of image that I was referring to.
Um, so, you know, it's more common to encounter metastases presenting as just, you know, pleural thickening, like some of the earlier slides uh, with or without a uh, malignant pleural fusion than just a discrete mass. So, you know, for pleural masses, um, you know, we're going to be thinking about uh, lipomas, solitary fibrous uh, pleural tumors on the benign side, and then the occasional metastasis on the thymola being the classic example. So there you have it. Uh, we've kind of uh, hopefully done a relatively thorough um, um, kind of uh, uh, walkthrough of uh, plural pathologies um, according to um, the phases of matter.